Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation of Flying to the Bahamas. We're proud to be partnered with the Bahamas Ministry of Tourism, who makes all of this possible and helps make social flight itself possible. For those of you joining us for the first time, I'd like to welcome you to the social flight community. Social Flight is the free web and mobile app that's dedicated to supporting general aviation. Socialflight.com or the Social Flight mobile apps for Apple or Android devices have over 10,000 aviation events and destinations, and the good news for all us pilots is it's all free. From fly-ins to pancake breakfasts, air shows, FAA seminars, and $100 hamburger destination, it's all on Social Flight, and our mission is to give pilots like yourselves more reasons to get out there and fly. With over 50,000 pilots already using Social Flight to plan their next adventure, we hope that you'll all leave here and check it out for yourselves. Now, in addition to the events that you can fly to, we have online events, which is why we are all here tonight. So before we get started, here's a few tips. A recording of tonight's presentation will be available on socialflight.com, usually within a few hours, but definitely by tomorrow morning, and we will send you a link by email after the presentation. Feel free to post questions during the presentation, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. We'll try to fit some of the questions in during the presentation uh, as it uh, fits. One more item regarding audio. Uh, I recommend using the dial-in audio versus your computer, but you can do either. And on the screen is the instructions on how you use the drop-down underneath audio options to choose whether you are using the dial-in or listen-only side of things. Uh, we're fortunate to have a very special presenter tonight. His name is Mike Zinjunas, but most of us refer to him as Mike Z. Mike has been flying and boating in the Bahamas since the early 80s. He was the first person to fly a light sport airplane to the Bahamas after the restrictions on experimental and light sport plane airplanes were lifted back in 2010. And he's organized 18 flying events to the Bahamas. And because of that, he was chosen to be a flying ambassador due to his wealth of experience and passion about the Bahamas. Personally, I've wanted to fly to the Bahamas since I got my license, so I'll be listening closely and planning my trip very soon. And so with that, I will hand it over to Mike. Welcome, Mike. Hey, good evening, Jeff. Um, first of all, I'd like to say uh, I'm a, a fairly recent social flight subscriber, and uh, I really love it. We've used it to put some events up that uh, stuff we do here in Lakeland. And uh, it's really easy to use, and uh, so uh, I'm I'm pleased to be part of it. Um, tonight, I want to try to show everybody, you know, just how easy it is to fly over to the Bahamas. I've been doing it for a long time, and there's a lot of myths and monsters under the bed, and I'm going to see if I can't clear that up for a lot of people. I've got a little presentation here that we can go through that kind of walks you step by step through how to do this. Um, but I do have a little shameless self-promotion I'd like to do. Um, I'm one of the organizers of the second annual Grand Bahama Air Show, and so hopefully we'll get a chance to, you know, let our, uh, our participants hear about that. So I think we have a slide that has a video of uh, the Bahama Air Show. I don't know if there's audio that people can hear or not. If not, I'll talk over it. There won't be any audio, but we are going to start the video now. For those of you, the, the, the video quality will depend on your bandwidth connection, and so you may see it a bit choppy, but the rest of the presentation is regular slides, so we'll give this a shot during our presentation. All right, and I'm just going to try to talk everyone through it as it comes up here. Okay, back in 2010, the government of the Bahamas um, changed a lot of the restrictions they had on light sport and experimental airplanes. And I got involved with flying over there then. Um, as part of this process, as we've developed how can we generate um, general aviation tourism for the Bahamas, one of the ideas the Minister of Tourism had was to have Grand Bahama Air Show. And in 2016, we had the first Grand Bahama Air Show, and it was the first air show in the country in 17 years. And it's on the beach. It's a lot of fun. Um, we didn't have a lot of fly-in turnout. Um, they had a wonderful uh, festival on the beach. The locals couldn't believe what they were seeing. And uh, so now this year, May 19th and 20th, will be the second annual Grand Bahama Air Show. This is a beach air show. 
And it's comprised of a couple of things. Um, fly-in participants um, are encouraged to fly in on May 18th. And if you arrive at Freeport International Airport between, uh, oh, about 11 and 3 on the 18th, the Ministry of Tourism is going to have a welcome reception that will have rum punch and concerters while you're waiting to clear customs. It's a great way to get welcomed into the country. May 19th, we will have our career fair and Young Eagles Rally. We Last year, we had 200 Bahamian school children came out to the career fair to learn about the various careers available to them. You have to understand that in the Bahamas, almost everything is, is delivered to the various islands by either airplane or boat. So for them, um, a, an aviation career is part of their national infrastructure. Last year, we flew 26 um, young Bahamian um, teenagers as part of a Young Eagles program. This year, we're hoping to fly 50. Uh, we are looking for volunteer pilots. Young Eagle pilots is, will be an EAA Young Eagle event. Um, so if you're a Young Eagle pilot and you're thinking about wanting to go over to the Bahamas and you want to do the, a Young Eagles event in the prettiest place on earth, uh, please contact me and, and we'll get you hooked up to do that. And then on Friday the, the 19th, we will do a dress rehearsal for the air show. It's a, a practice air show. It'll start at about, oh, five, between 5 and 5.30. Time's kind of a nebulous thing in the Bahamas. Um, so we're going to do a practice air show. That will be on the beach. And then May 20th, Saturday, will be the main beach air show. Now, it's going to start late in the, in the afternoon. This allows everybody to be able to enjoy the beach, go snorkeling, have a nice day, show up down at the Tano Beach, which is where they have the um, air show. You will be able to, we're going to open with a flag jump where the Bahamian flag will be jumped uh, onto the beach um, while the uh, school choir is singing the Bahamian National Anthem. We did it last year. They had never seen it before. It was the most amazing thing. And then this year we have Aeroshell as our headliner. Aeroshell will circle the jumper as he makes his way down to the beach. And then they are going to go right into their uh, four ship. They got four T6 Texans. It's loud. It's noisy. It's smoky. And they've never seen anything like this over in the Bahamas. They're going to do their routine. Then we've got acts like Paul Schulten, John Black. We're going to have flybys from the Defense Force. And then Aeroshell will do their famous twilight um, routine. And anybody that's been to Sun and Sun or uh, Oshkosh Air Venture knows what that routine looks like. We've already told the police captain over in the Bahamas to expect um, some UFO sightings over the island because anybody who's seen it, uh, it's, it's pretty spectacular. And if you don't know what you're looking at, it looks sort of like a, a UFO. There are a number of hotel, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> hotel deals. Um, the Viva Fortuna Hotel, which is a Wyndham resort, it's an all-inclusive resort, is going to be where the air show team and air show performers are going to be hanging out. Rooms are available there at a 30% discount. And if we go to the, the Hamas Flying uh, website, we can see uh, all the contact information there. Additionally, uh, Pelican Bay and Flamingo Bay will also have uh, deals for flying in pilots. And that pretty much covers my shameless self-promotion. So, okay, Mike, we've got the slide up for the requirements to fly outside the United States. Okay, so let's, let's look at this slide for a minute. And um, most of these laws are U.S. laws in compliance with the ICAO International Treaty for Aviation. So we're going to just walk through it very simply, the kinds of things you need. So the first for the airplane is the U.S. Customs decal. This is uh, available through the customs website, dtops.gov. It's, uh, I think it's $27. The sticker is good for unlimited access across the U.S. border for U.S. registered aircraft, and uh, you stick the sticker on your airplane. If you're like me and you're always doing stuff kind of at the last minute, uh, don't worry too much about if you don't have the sticker in hand. When you purchase it online, you will be given a, uh, a, a payment receipt. If you print that receipt and carry it in your flight bag, that will be good enough. 
Um, international law or U.S. law requires for international flights that the aircraft had a, have a radio station license. If you're old like me and you learned to fly back in the 70s, aircraft and, and pilots had to have a license. Uh, we did away with that in the 80s um, for domestic flying, but this isn't domestic flying. This will be an international flight. Now, having said all that, I've never had to show my radio station license or my restricted radio telephone operator's permit ever. So you can use your own judgment there. Um, U.S. requires 12-inch end numbers when penetrating the air defense identification zone, which is that big scary thing we've read so much about in Flying Magazine between here and, and foreign countries. And I'm going to shed a little bit of light on the ADIS later on. But 12-inch numbers for those who fly light sport airplanes, and I'm one of you. Um, many of those aircraft with 12 inch end number won't fit. Please just put the largest that will fit on the on the uh, side of the fuselage as you possibly can. For those of you who have fancy paint schemes and, and don't wanna have a big number on your airplane all the time, there are a number of places that you can get temporary end numbers that are made from vinyl that doesn't stick really well. It sticks well enough to not fall off but well enough, less enough to be able to pull off later on. Um, life jackets, well, if you're flying Part 91, life jackets aren't required, but uh, it's a, it's depending on where you're crossing from Florida, it's about 80 miles across open water. Uh, not a bad idea. Uh, life rafts, again, flying Part 91, they're not required. So a life raft that you bought on eBay from a military surplus place, will suffice because you're not required to carry the life raft, but having a life raft would be a whole lot better. Tie downs. If you're flying to Freeport for the air show, they have cable tie downs. But if you're flying around the islands, there aren't a lot of tie downs at some of the airports. And I don't get a, a commission from the Claw tie down company, but I can tell you I carry them in my airplane and they will set in the sandstone that makes up the geology of the Bahamas pretty well. Um, but if you're going to use a claw tie down over there, two things. Bring a bigger hammer because the little hammer won't quite drive the stakes in. And two, don't drive the stakes all the way in because you'll never get them out. So now, those are the things we need for the airplane. Let's look at the pilot. Again, we're back to that radio, um, restricted radio telephone operator's permit. Um, those of us who learned to fly originally back in the 70s, you had to have one. If you still have it from back then, it's still good. If you lost yours like I did, um, you're going to have to get another one. And it's uh, $60 from the uh, Federal Communications Commission. Again, I bought it, but I've never showed it to anybody. After 9-11, the U.S. Customs Service created an online um, manifest filing for aircraft and boats going um, across the U.S. borders. It's called EAPIS. Um, when it first came out, there was a lot of hue and cry about, oh, if you don't do this, you're going to get fined and they're going to beat you and take your firstborn. The reality is they've come up with a way to make it simple, easy, and we're going to talk about how to get through that. But you're going to need an, an outbound and inbound declaration that we're going to show you how to do that. Uh, U.S. law requires that in order to come back into the country, you have to have a passport. So everybody who's going with you needs to have a passport. Uh, Bahamas charts. Um, most of the Bahamas is covered by either um, the World Air Chart uh, CH-26 or the Miami sectional if you're only going um, in the northern Bahamas. Um, those charts are also on ForeFlight. I'm a ForeFlight user, and uh, so I use it. And then there's uh, several pilot guides. Uh, one is free from the government of the Bahamas. Um, and we can send that to you if you're interested in going. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, so we talked about the EAPIS. So this is the paperwork, and we're just going to, there's three things. There's going to be EAPIS, which we're going to talk about in a second. The, the Bahamas form C7A, and this is very important. They, they, they made something kind of confusing, the C7 and the C7A. The C7A is what we want. It's our cruising permit. And when we have that form, that allows us to do 
as much island hopping, as many takeoffs and landings as we want to within the, the country without additional government fees. And then you'll also fill out a Bahamian immigration card. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, the EAPIS, Electronic Advanced Passenger Information System. Um, that is how you find them. You see the uh, link on the bottom of the page there. You're going to set up a pilot and any regular passenger, like a spouse, as crew. The reason for that is your crew is saved in the memory. You're going to create an account. It's got a password, a username and password. And uh, so it stores all your information. It stores your aircraft. It stores your crew. So now when you're going to go file one, the first time you do it, it's going to take about 45 minutes. I've gotten to where I can talk people through it on the phone in my car while I'm driving because I, I've done it so many times that I can actually help you without having to see the screen. And um, you're going to have your permanent address of, of the crew. If you're bringing passengers for a one-time thing, you're going to have to load them each time. It will not save your passengers. So now once you've created your account, you've got your airplane and your crew and your wife can be your crew. Now it's time to file your outbound and inbound um, declaration for each trip. Now when you're filling this thing out online, first of all, it won't let you make a mistake. If it doesn't like what you put in, it's going to give you a little red flag saying, no, we don't want to see it this way, or you can't use this symbol, or whatever. So it'll walk you through the whole thing. Um, the most important thing you need to understand about EAPIS is that manifest is good for the entire day. It goes into great questioning about when you think you're going to cross the border, uh, at what location. Don't worry too much about that. The most important thing you need to know is for your outbound and your inbound, it's good for the entire day. If you get over to the Bahamas and realize that your inbound is going to change, just create a new one. If the location of where you're going to arrive changes, the date of when you arrive changes, then you need to make a new one. If you're simply running late, you do not need to, to do a new one. And we'll explain a little bit more about how that works in a few minutes. You must arrive and depart in the Bahamas from a, a port of entry, and you must arrive back to the United States at a port of entry. If you're flying from the United States and you're a United States citizen in a U.S. registered airplane, you can fly from anywhere direct to the Bahamas without clearing out of U.S. customs. It's very important. You don't have to worry about going to some port of entry to leave from here. There is no clearing out process for U.S. citizens in U.S. registered aircraft. However, coming home, you must land at one of the ports of entry, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I recommend filing your inbound and your outbound at the same time. Most of us are on a little bit of a schedule. We know when we have to be back. You can file in the office 30 days in advance down to an hour before you leave. When you file it, it's going to give you a confirmation code. After you've all done it and you've submitted it, it's going to have a, your itinerary and a, com a confirmation code. It's important, I do everything on an iPhone or iPad, so I just do a screenshot of it. If you're doing it on your desktop, print the page. There's a place where you can click to print that page. It's very important you have that confirmation code for both your inbound and your outbound. Now let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, one of the things I like to do before I leave, the Bahamas has done a wonderful job of creating a pilot's guide for flying to the Bahamas. And in the back of it has this C7A uh, cruising permit. And it's very important to use that one. The C7 form is for um, business or commercial flights. Here's the difference. A C7A, to process that when you get to the Bahamas is $50. And it allows you to do as many takeoffs and landings 
in the Bahamas as you want for that one fifty dollar fee, and you just carry that C seven A with you. If you mistakenly fill out the seven C seven with no A after it, that's for a commercial flight, and then each takeoff and each landing will be seventy five dollars. So please. Print that form before you go, fill it out before you go. You can copy it out of the, out of the back of that cruising guide and have it filled out in advance. And the only thing I don't do is I don't sign it and I don't have my time of arrival until I arrive at customs. This will eliminate any confusion as to whether or not you're a commercial flight. The government of the Bahamas has, a, has some interesting ways of determining whether or not you're a commercial flight. Um, in there, they're going to ask for the owner operator of the aircraft. If it's your airplane and you own it in an LLC, just put your name. Do not put your corporation. Often, um, customs officials will misinterpret that as you being a professional pilot flying for that corporation. So please, if you're an owner operator and your airplane is registered in an LLC, when you're filling out your paperwork over there, please just put yourself as the owner. So when you arrive in the Bahamas, you're going to you're going to hand in this C. You're going to give customs C7A. They're going to keep two copies. You're going to keep one. They're going to stamp it. That copy stays with you as you fly around the Bahamas. If you land at another airport in the Bahamas that has customs, it's nice for you to just go in and have them stamp it to show that you've you, you that way they can see you've already cleared formalities. If you land at an airport that doesn't have customs, often what will happen is the local policeman will ask to see your cruising permit. Simply show it to them. This is, an, this is a country that has 300 years of piracy and smuggling in its history. So they're very sensitive to aircraft and boats being there illegally. So please be understanding of that. When you get ready to leave the Bahamas, you're gonna turn your C7A in when you're leaving. The other piece of paperwork you're going to do when you get to the Bahamas is fill out an immigration card. And it doesn't matter whether you come on a cruise ship, on an airliner, or if you're coming in your private aircraft, you're still going to fill out this card. The fees, as I said earlier, $50 for the C7A, that's a one-time processing fee. As many takeoffs and landings, there will be no more government charges. When I say no more government charges, if you go to an FBO and you tie down overnight, there'll be charges. Those aren't government charges, just like here in the United States, those are FBO charges. When you get ready to leave the Bahamas, and we'll talk about clearing out in a few minutes, you will have to pay $29 per person departure tax. And that's pretty much true anywhere you go when you fly down in the islands. Let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, so leaving the U.S., arriving in the Bahamas, um, and then the return home. So let's move to the next slide. This one doesn't really have a lot to on it. Okay, so leaving the United States. You can file IFR for those of you who are instrument rated, and it works exactly like it does in the United States, there is absolutely no difference for you. You file, you go to Freeport or wherever you're going, and there is absolutely no change. The system works exactly like it works in the United States all the way to you get over to the Bahamas with no changes. VFR pilots, and there's been a lot of confusion about this, you're going to file an international VFR flight plan. And most of us we learned to fly a long time ago, remember this very ponderous looking uh, international VFR flight plan, forget it. Just use your regular flight plan form. There are only three questions that are additional when you go to file your flight plan. So um, you're gonna file it with international flight service, just regular flight service number. You're gonna file it and you're going to open it just like you normally would, okay? It is not a DVFR flight plan. DVFR means that we're going to go through um, either a section of ADIS that is like if you leave from Naples, Florida and go down to the Keys, or if you're going to go into the FRZ around Washington. Those are defense VFR flight plans. This is going to be an international flight plan. 
Um, I like using flight following big time. I like using flight, VFR flight following. Um, know that you're not getting cleared to do anything. Depending on how far you're flying in the Bahamas, about 6,500 feet is the minimum altitude you need to be able to get radar service pretty much anywhere in the Bahamas. The farther you go, obviously, the higher you have to get. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, arriving in the Bahamas, when you're making your flight plan, you want to land at an AOE, airport of entry, and those are all listed in the Bahamas Flying Guide. If you're landing at Freeport and or Nassau, those are the only two operating control towers in the country. And Marsh Harbor's getting ready to build one. Uh, they've been telling me for the last four years it'll be open next week. Uh, it's still not open. But if you land at an airport with an operating control tower, they will close your flight plan for you automatically. If I'm landing someplace else that doesn't have a control tower, I will close my flight plan before I start my descent. You gotta remember, we could be 80, 100, 150 miles from the US, which means once we get much below oh, 6,500 feet, we won't have radio service to Miami. So we want to close that flight plan before we start our descent. If you forget to do it, you can call from the ground when you get to the FBO. Okay, when you land in the Bahamas and you're landing in an AOE, that means there's going to be uh, Bahamians Customs there. So you're going to, just like you would anywhere, you're going to taxi up to the customs area. You're going to get out with your paperwork. Um, some places, if you're going into Freeport or Nassau, they're going to have people from the FBO come out to get your bags, bring you into the customs area. If you're going into one of the smaller islands that has an AOE, you may have to carry your bags. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so let's get, jump to your return home. Once you've cleared into the Bahamas and you have your C7A, you are free to fly around the country as much as you like within the country. Um, there are, aren't any really flight plans that are required. If you're flying in or out of Freeport or Nassau and you want to leave, uh, they have an interesting form of clearance delivery. Um, they have a form that looks exactly like a U.S. VFR flight plan form, except it's in yellow paper. And in order to get in the queue for the tower to know what you want to do, you're going to fill out this form, and the FBO faxes it to the tower. And then that's going to be sort of your clearance delivery. They know what you want to do. If you're flying to an island that doesn't have a tower, doesn't have a way to close the flight plan, you can put non-closure in the method of closure, which means they're going to close it automatically at the time that you're supposed to get there. Um, so now you've flown around the Bahamas, you had a great time, you're ready to go home. You must leave the Bahamas from one of the airports of entry. It doesn't have to be the one that you landed at. It can be another one, but it must be an airport of entry. When you get there, um, usually these AOEs have FBOs there. And the FBO has the telephones and all the uh, flight planning materials that you need to be able to plan your flight home. The, got, the uh, ministry, uh, the aviation ministry, spent a lot of money putting in the infrastructure for you to be able to do U.S.-style flight planning and communications with the United States. When you get there, you're going to pay your departure tax. You're going to clear out of the country, which means you're going to surrender your C-7A and your immigration card along with $29 per person and you're going to get a C7 Bahamas outward declaration and what that does that's essentially a trans diary it allows you it, it proves you cleared out of Bahamas customs when you come back to the United States so you're in the FBO there you've cleared out of customs you're going to call flight service you're going to file a flight plan now remember that scary aid is we were talking about earlier when you're talking to flight service and getting your flight plan and then going to, you know, you're going to get a briefing, you're going to flight plan, file your flight plan, ask them for a squawk code right now. 
The air defense identification system, which is clearly marked on sectional charts by a purple dotted line with big bold letters that says a USA DIS next to it, we need to have a code other than 1200 in order to enter that space. We need to know, the United States needs to know who's coming and going. The easiest way to get this is get a squawk code from the briefer when you're talking to them while you're filing your flight plan. They'll be happy to give it to you. Now you don't have to worry about where the aid is. is. Once you get in the air, if you're using flight following, they may give you and probably will give you another code. Don't worry, as long as it's not 1200 and you're flying towards the United States, you don't have to worry about it. As long as your transponder is on, squawking something other than 1200, the ADIS no longer exists. So you're gonna call customs, get that squawk code, file your flight plan. So the other phone call you have to make is to the US customs where you are planning to arrive. So let's say we're flying from Freeport back to um, say Fort Pierce, one of my favorite places to come back in. I'm gonna call inside the FBO, there'll be a phone, has their number, you call them up and you say, hey, this is November 5732 Delta. I uh, wanna call a notice of arrival. Okay, I should be there at two o'clock in the afternoon. Customs doesn't know from Zulu time. Give it to them in local. He's gonna go, okay, great. Uh, your confirmation code is EJ. That's the guy's initials. Write that down. This is very, very important because if you have to divert, this, is, this will come in, in handy. Try not to arrive before the time you've told them. This is where no matter what it says on your EAPIS, you thought you were gonna leave at 12, you're gonna get there by two, now it's two, you're gonna get there at four. Don't worry, your EAPIS is still good. This phone call resets that time. They don't want, you get about an hour or so late time window, but don't arrive early. It awakens them from their slumber and it makes them really grumpy. Let's go ahead and move on to the uh, next slide, please. Okay, back to this, what we were talking before. Before crossing the ADIS, now we're getting that comps, uh, transponder code while we're on the phone with flight service. Okay, once we do that, the ADIS doesn't exist anymore, okay? It's, it is our defenses for the United States. Aircraft that they don't know who it is, they're gonna send a jet up after you. And the call goes like this, it's on 121.5. Uh, Cherokee tied 45 miles east of Miami. This is Air Force Jet 16. You need to contact the FAA immediately. And you're going to call ATC and they're going to give you a code and they're going to do all this. And a month later, you're going to get a bill from the, uh, the uh, reserve squadron at a homestead for about $20,000 of jet fuel for the jet ride you didn't get. So please do not enter the US ADIS squawk in 1200. Right? You're going to cross it going out. Now, going out, interestingly, as long as you're flying away from the United States, you actually can be in the ADIS squawk in 1200. It's not recommended, but you can do it. But do not be flying westbound towards the United States from the Bahamas in the ADIS squawk in 1200. Next slide. Okay, so when we were talking to customs on the phone and EJ gave us his initials, that's our confirmation code, and we're going to jot that down. And the reason for that is a lot of times, uh, especially in the spring and the, and the summertime, we get afternoon thunderstorms. And so while we were planning to go to Fort Pierce, um, a thunderstorm has developed over top of Fort Pierce, and now we can't get there. And so now we're going to divert to Palm Beach. Well, we didn't call Palm Beach Customs when you land. The customs lady there is going to be really angry because you didn't call her. You will say, well, well there's a thunderstorm over, uh, over top of Fort Pierce, and we had to divert here, and I talked to EJ, and that confirmation code will keep you from getting into trouble with U.S. Customs. So it's very important in the event of emergency, a weather diversion, please divert preferably to a, a, an airport that has customs, but you've already called where you had planned to go, you couldn't go there, it's okay. Okay, when you arrive, most of the customs um, 
um, ports in the United States have control towers. Just tell the ground you're trying to go to customs. They probably have figured it out because you're on a flight plan. They're going to get a taxi to the customs secure area, which is, in, is marked in red around on the ramp, painted on the ramp around the customs area. Put your aircraft into there. Uh, leave room for other aircraft. We can do so, please. Some of these areas are pretty small. You're going to open all the doors, take your bags out, bring your paperwork, and go inside of U.S. Customs. And this is where the IAPAS thing really works like crazy. You're going to fill in a U.S. immigration card, and that's it. When you walk in, you're going to give him your tail number. He's going to type in the computer, and that lovely IAPAS manifest that you filled out a month ago is going to pop up on the screen, and you're in and out of there in five minutes. And that's all there is to coming back into the United States. And next slide, please. I get a lot of questions about flying over water and what kinds of things do we want to do. And it's having done a lot of presentations over the years, I've heard a lot of questions, and I've determined that there are three monsters under the bed when it comes to flying to the Bahamas. Uh, one of them has to do with the ADIS. And we talked about that earlier, if you squat 1,200, we don't have to worry about that anymore because the ADIS doesn't exist as long as we're not squawking 1,200 when we come back. And we can get that code before we, we um, return. The other one has to do with flying over water in a single engine airplane. Now, I'm an AMP uh, with an inspection authorization, and there is a mechanical reason for why airplanes go auto rough over water and it's caused by the loose nut holding the stick. The reality is the airplane has no idea it's over water. Only you do. The first time you fly out there, you're going to go, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. I'm over the water. I'm over the water. Um, I'm looking back at Fort Lauderdale. Going, I think I can glide back to that beach. I think I can glide back to that beach. And at some point when you figure out that you can't, you're going to look forward and you're going to see the beautiful turquoise waters of the Bahamas. And it's it's a lot like doing a full age flight. All of a sudden, you start focusing on the beauty, and you forget you're flying over the water. The other thing that's nice about flying over the water, you can fly over the water in the middle of the day, and it's smooth as glass. There are no thermals. There's no turbulence. So um, it's actually once you get over the fact that you're flying over the water, it, be, it becomes a very enjoyable flight. So there are some things you can do. Um, it's not a bad idea to keep some sort of a ditch plan, no understanding what's going to happen. If you if you lose an engine over the water, you're going swimming. Uh, the good news is the water is about 80 degrees. Uh, there are lots of boats and cruise ships out there, so there are ways to kind of mitigate that risk. Um, carrying um, spot um, uh, location services is kind of nice. You have somebody back at home kind of keeping track of your progress and keep giving the thumbs up and sending them pictures of how great it is in the Bahamas, and they'll be jealous, and they won't care if you crash in the water anymore. Um, make sure somebody knows what you're doing. You're going over there, file a, a local uh, flight plan with your friends or family. Hey, uh, this is what I'm doing. I expect to get there at this time. And then give them some contact numbers for the airport so they can call and say, hey, did so-and-so arrive? Oh, yeah, he's over in a bar drinking rum punch. Don't worry about it. Um, fuel considerations. We all know what the FAA minimums for fuel is. Um, those don't work out there. This is a little bit, uh, fuel out in the Bahamas is a little bit like driving across the desert. You never pass a gas station. Um, my personal minimums for flying around in, in the Bahamas is 100 miles. Notice I didn't say it in time. Depending on which direction I'm going, I want to be able to go 100 miles. So I've got a headwind, that's a longer time than if I'm going downwind. Uh, everyone's going to have their own personal minimum. Freeport, Nassau, uh, the big islands generally have fuel all the time. If you're going to go island hopping, I highly recommend that you call ahead. If your aircraft has an auto gas FCC or is allowed to fly on auto gas, it's got a road tax engine, um, all of the marinas in the Bahamas have a fuel that's equivalent to Rec 90 here, and they don't put alcohol in it. So it's safe to put in your airplane if you have an airplane that has an auto gas STC. Um, weather in the Bahamas, it's pretty straightforward. Um, 
the British called the Bahamas the islands of perpetual June. Uh, when you leave out of out of Florida, going over to the Bahamas, you're going to encounter a, a line of, of cumulus clouds over the Gulf Stream. Um, bases are typically 1,500 feet and tops are about 5,500 feet. You'll see it. You'll fly right over the top of it. And unless there's a major weather system, and that this is basic flight planning, you'll see you should be able to expect pretty much what flight service tells you. You know, uh, hurricane season, obviously there will be lots of warnings about flying over there. And in the wintertime, the weather services from flight service is pretty good about predicting weather in the Bahamas. And last slide. So here are the websites that show you all of the information about flying over to the Bahamas. Um, when you look at the Bahamas.com uh, forward slash flying site, you will find a list of flying ambassadors. Uh, and I am one of the flying ambassadors. There are, I think, 11 of us. We are all pilots who have flown over to the Bahamas for years. Um, our role is to try to help you to plan your flight, give you information, and there's contact information for each and every one of us. And if you've got questions or you needed assistance, Please don't hesitate to contact us. We'll do the best we can to give you the most current information possible. So hopefully, I've answered most of your questions. Hopefully, I've enticed you with this fantastic beach air show that we're putting on. And if there are any questions, or Jeff, you got anything, I'm here to try to help you out. Well, Mike, thank you so much. What a great presentation. And uh, it certainly gave me some information to motivate uh, me to make that trip to I've always wanted to do. We do have a few questions that have come in. Um, one of the questions that comes in, first of all, is uh, what is the status of basic med having to do with the Bahamas? Excellent question. We are actively working uh, with the uh, civil aviation over there. Today, the Bahamas government has mimicked U.S. law. Uh, basically, their, uh, their attitude has been um, that if it's safe and legal to fly in the United States, it's safe and legal to fly in the Bahamas. Um, we were hoping that we'd have an announcement as early as sun and fun, but I must say that this is an election year. The election is in May in the Bahamas, not a U.S. election year, but a Bahamas election year. Uh, so like here, the government kind of paralyzes a little bit during that process. Um, I would think if you don't see something announced at Sun and Fun. The Bahamas has a huge, huge presence at the Sun and Fun fly-in. Um, if they don't make an announcement there, you can certainly count on it by Oscar. But it's likely they're going to do what we do. Okay. Uh, another thing that I think we can we can answer there's some questions about how you pay the the fee, and and I think the answer we got here is that it's almost always in cash. Um, depends. And most of the the larger um, airport of entries that have FBOs, um, you can pay that as part of your bill. When you pay your fuel and all that, if you don't have cash, the FBO will take your credit card and put those fees on that. Uh, in the out islands, if you're leaving from a, an out island AOE, and you'll be surprised when you look at the Bahamas guide how many AOEs there are, uh, some of those are cash only. If there's a question, when you get to, if you're going to go island hopping, you go down to some of the family islands, which for me is is my favorite part of the Bahamas. When you arrive there and you show him your little C7A and he stamps it, just ask him what he's going to require. And if cash is an issue, the neat thing about the Bahamas is they'll work it out. If if you ended up with no cash and you've been staying down there, they'll they'll they will make it happen. But the best thing to do is to be proactive. And when you're when you're arrived and you, before you go off to your hotel, just ask the customs guy, hey, what are you look, going to look for? I'm going to be flying home from here. Um, do you need cash or is there a way I can pay this with my credit card? Okay. Hey, when you land, what do you have to actually bring into the customs office with you from luggage or things like that? It's interesting. It depends on where you land. Um, if you land at Freeport or Nassau, Marsh Harbor, some of the bigger places, the guy's going to come out with a little golf cart or a trolley of some kind, and he's going to, they're going to pick up your bags and put them all in there, and they're going to take you straight to, to customs. When you get down island in some of the smaller places, 
you, 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 your airplane's right outside the guy's office, and so you just kind of saunter in there with, uh, with your, all your paperwork and say, do you want me to bring my bags? And, and, and it'll be up to the customs guy. But How about coming back you, into the U.S.? Coming back to the United States, it's pretty universal. The you know, customs is pretty specific. They want you to take all your bags out of the airplane. I leave my life jackets and stuff like that in there, take all my bags out of the airplane, and they want you to leave the doors and baggage compartments open in the United States. Okay. Are there any planned caravan flights going down, or what, what can you tell us about trips? Okay. Well, we've got um, – I've got a trip that I'm putting together uh, the week after Sun and Fun for a group of uh, uh, Thorpe builders. Uh, Thorpe's a little low-wing metal experimental airplane, very fast. Um, And we're going to be going over to uh, uh, Green Turtle Key the week after Sun and Fun. Um, Of course, we're trying to get as many pilots that want to come over for the Grand Bahama Air Show. And I'll say this. For a first time going to the Bahamas um, excursion, this Bahamas air show thing is just tailor-made for a first-timer. Um, Ministry of Tourism is going to throw this great reception on the 18th. Um, we're going to try to organize groups that are leaving from different areas um, so they can kind of arrive at the same time, hence the reason for the reception. When we do these flyouts, we sort of overwhelm the customs people, and so we've learned to hey, let's bring out some food and some drinks and let everybody relax while we're waiting in the line for customs. Um, if you go and look at the Bahamas.com uh, forward slash flying and look at the uh, flying ambassadors, there are a number of fly-in events that other ambassadors put together. And these are great ways to do it because other people are going, somebody's there to advise you, somebody's going to be there to greet you when you arrive. So you're not just showing up cold on the doorstep. Having said that, you can show up cold on the doorstep and know that as long as you bring a little bit of patience, the Bahamas does things at their own time, and know that it's going to work out, you can show up on the doorstep with your paperwork not filled out, not quite sure what to do, and as long as you have a a smiling face and a a willingness to accept that things aren't going to happen rapid fast like they do here in the United States, you're going to have a great time. What about pets? Like, hmm, That's a good question. I'll have to do some research on pets. I know you can bring pets, but that rule keeps changing how what the procedures are, and I'll have to find out for you. I see that uh, Elizabeth Vance from the Minister, Thomas Ministry of Tourism has commented on the actual uh, chat line here saying that pets can come, but you need an import certificate from agriculture. So there is some some more information uh, that uh, that you need to do, and the paperwork could take a while. Yeah, I think you have to do most of that in advance, and I'm sure Elizabeth can give give you more details. And, again, anybody has a specific question can contact me, and I will find the answer for you. Okay. Um, Let's see, another reminder just for everybody, this presentation is and has been recorded and will be available uh, beginning tomorrow. And you get a link via the email that should help with all of that. So uh, with that, I'd just like to thank Mike uh, and the Bahamas Ministry of Tourism for putting on this and supporting social flight and being such an uh, important part of general aviation. And I think this is a fantastic opportunity for pilots to, to take this great adventure and uh, experience a, a part of general aviation that I think uh, really is something few people actually get to do and more people should be able to do it. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. And again, you will be getting an email following the presentation with information. And tomorrow you'll be able to uh, go to that link and get a recording from this. If you have any follow-up questions, um, the uh, information will be in the link. And uh, Mike, is there a direct way for you to be reached that you'd like to communicate to everybody? Yes. It, anybody that has a, a question can uh, can email me at mikezcfi at gmail.com. Now uh, that is if you, on my that is the email that's on my uh, flying ambassador page um, on the Bahamas website. Um, but if you've got a specific question, you can do that. And I would encourage anybody to look at the the other flyings that are available different times of the year. 
Um, and though there are different ambassadors that handle each one of those. All of us have been trained, have been around the Bahamas a long time. All of us, if we can't answer the question, we know somebody who can. So feel free, free to contact us. There is a wealth of information on the Bahamas website, and there's a section on there you can go to for private flying that should give you so much of this information. And also, again, as Mike mentioned, link to the ambassadors and allow you to contact them directly, including Mike, because obviously this, everyone's got a lot of questions out there, and some of them will be personal, and I'm sure that Mike can help you out. And again, Mike, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks to uh, the Ministry of Tourism for the Bahamas, and I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful evening. And please, when you get a chance, if you're not a Social Flight user, just check out socialflight.com or Social Flight on the App Store. It's completely free, and it's here to make things like this evening come to you and keep you informed about that. So everyone have a great evening, and thank you very much.